Today, this is the new normal for us. The fear terrorizing Great Britain, and it's not what you'd think. You have to be very careful what you say in Britain today. Plus, a former member of the family. I gave myself over to a madman. Tells how she survived living with Charles Manson. And the holidays like you've never spent them before. Get ready for a total Christmas makeover on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. The term intifada means shaking. And under Yasser Arafat, there was a shaking when the Palestinians rose up to protest what really would have been a very favorable treaty. And now uh, the elements of Hamas and some of the other radical uh, Arab groups are saying because of President Trump's very bold decision, they're going to start a second intifada. Now, is it going to be successful? Will there be riots? Will there be some trouble? Well, there probably will be. But the truth is, we've been playing around with that situation in Jerusalem for decades. And President Trump did what was the obvious decision to be made. Congress had said, let's move the embassy to Jerusalem. And every year, the president had to issue a waiver because, why well, they weren't going to do it. But now, uh, the president has said, we're going to recognize Jerusalem as what it is. It's the capital of Israel. And we're going to put our embassy there because we should. And uh, if the Arab states don't like it, that's tough luck. But the truth is, they should like it. Why not? And there's nothing in there that prohibits a two-state solution, prohibits uh, having a part of Jerusalem that's used for the Arabs. There's nothing in his statement that does that. All it does is say Jerusalem should be the capital of Israel, and we're going to have an embassy there. That's it. We have a perfect right to do it. The Israelis have a perfect right to designate their capital, and that's what we're doing. We're acknowledging a fact. Terry. Despite that perfect right, the president's perfect action right. has been severely criticized by other world leaders because they say it will hurt the peace process. But it's a move millions of Americans and Jews have been looking forward to for decades. CBN's Jennifer Wishon has the story from the White House. By recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and moving the U.S. Embassy there, President Donald Trump has secured his place in history and demonstrated another reason why Americans elected an outsider not beholden to tradition. We cannot solve our problems by making the same failed assumptions and repeating the same failed strategies of the past. After decades of failed peace negotiations and a continuation of violence, President Trump says it's time to do something different. It is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. For decades, Democrats and Republicans running for president dangled the promise of recognizing Jerusalem, only to fail to follow through once in office. President Trump delivered. He says he's just acknowledging reality, that Jerusalem has been Israel's capital for decades, and kicking off a new strategy for peace while reaffirming that the U.S. would support a two-state solution if that's what both sides agreed to. Above all, our greatest hope is for peace, the universal yearning in every human soul. Immediately, enthusiastic praise poured in from a diverse group of evangelical leaders. Former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee says President Donald Trump did what his predecessors didn't have the courage to do. In doing so, he set two great examples, how to make good on promises and how to treat your friends. Reverend Samuel Rodriguez says the historical record, empirical fact and our faith all confirm that Jerusalem is in fact the capital of the Jewish people. I therefore enthusiastically applaud President Trump's decision. And Bishop Harry Jackson says it marks the beginning of a new season in U.S. Middle East policy. The previous administration allowed persecution, terrorism and stereotyping of the Israeli people. President Trump called for a continuation of the status quo at Jerusalem's holy sites. Jerusalem is today and must remain a place where Jews pray at the Western Wall, where Christians walk 
the Stations of the Cross, and where Muslims worship at Al-Aqsa Mosque. With the president's announcement, now architects, engineers, and planners will begin building America's new embassy in Jerusalem. It will take some time to complete, but the president says he's building a magnificent tribute to peace. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, the White House. Well, it'll remain to be seen whether this will be a monument to peace or not, but the Palestinians will not like it, but the, uh, the Arab nations will recognize it really is a minor a bump along the road, and as far as the Saudis are concerned, the Iranians are their enemy, and the Palestinians are kind of a sideshow. So we'll see what happens. But I, I, I think the president did a very courageous thing. And let's face it, Jerusalem has been the capital of Israel ever since the days of King David. King David conquered the city, took the uh, place that was called Mount Zion, and uh, it's been our, the capital of, of Israel ever since. But according to the Bible, mark it down, the great fight is not uh, Megiddo, uh, you know, Armageddon is Mount of Megiddo. Uh, the Battle of Armageddon is not going to be fought at Megiddo, it's going to be fought in Jerusalem. They gather at Megiddo, but they march on Jerusalem. And that will be the contentious point uh, of uh, the nations of the world, they will come against Israel on account of Jerusalem. They mark it down. It's what the Bible says. But right now, the, the president is on the side of the angels, and he's done a very uh, bold thing that's going to redound well to the uh, success of the United States of America. Well, despite support here in the United States, some protests have already broken out in the Middle East against the president's move. Wendy Griffith has that. That's right, Pat. The clashes broke out across the West Bank today. Hundreds of Palestinians and Israeli troops faced off, and demonstrators in Gaza burned Israeli and U.S. flags. The protesters also set tires on fire and threw stones at anti-riot troops. But Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu led a chorus of Israeli officials praising and thanking President Trump. Chris Mitchell brings us that story from Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu led a chorus of Israeli officials praising and thanking President Trump. This is a historic day. Jerusalem has been the capital of the Jewish people for 3,000 years. It's been the capital of Israel for nearly 70 years. President Trump, thank you for today's historic decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The Jewish people and the Jewish state will be forever grateful. Just minutes after President Trump's decision, which was 8 p.m. Israel time, the city of Jerusalem adorned the walls of the old city behind me with a projected image that said, December 6th, Jerusalem applauds President Trump. I think, if anything, this move uh, will further and bring peace forward, since our neighbors have to realize that in any scenario, Jerusalem is the capital of the Jewish people. But Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas condemned Trump's decision. Trump's decision tonight will not change the status of Jerusalem and will not give any legitimacy to Israel in this issue because Jerusalem is a Palestinian and Arab Islamic Christian city and the eternal capital of Palestine. The PA called for three days of rage, while a chorus of voices in the region echoed the Palestinian Authority president. The IDF reported rioting by Hamas, and Hamas also organized this march of anger. Turkey's President Erdogan said Trump crossed a red line and called for an Islamic summit next week to discuss the decision. Turkey's foreign minister warned it threatened the region. This is an extremely irresponsible and wrong statement. Not only do we not accept this statement, we strongly condemn it because this kind of statement endangers the region's stability and security. Yet many evangelicals applauded the decision. Mike Evans of the Friends of Zion Museum in Jerusalem unfurled a banner that says, God bless Trump from Jerusalem, D.C., David's capital, to Washington, D.C. We believe what he did is going to bring the blessing of God on our own country, America. Evans compared President Trump to another U.S. president, Harry Truman, 
who 70 years ago, against the advice of his own State Department and many advisors, recognized the newly declared State of Israel. Evans believes we're seeing prophecy come to pass. And as somebody that's wanted and prayed and hoped for this for more than 40 years, I see us in the middle of prophecy right now. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Such an historic day, Pat. Well, it is historic, but you know, all those previous presidents have all promised that they have campaigned on the strength. We're going to put our embassy in Jerusalem. We will recognize Jerusalem. And then came the, the time, and they backed down, and they, they got cold feet. And primarily, it was the State Department that was leading the charge. Well, the Arabs won't like it. Well, look, what are they going to do about it? And are they going to sever relations with America? And the United Nations Security Council is meeting. Well, we have a veto in the Security Council. But even if we didn't, we give them all this money. So the truth is, if they keep making dumb moves, we can always say, fellas, we're not going to pay for your, your, your folly anymore. We're not going to pick up the tab. And I, I think that's going to send more of a message than anything else. Well, I've seen pictures, and perhaps you have too, of these unbelievable uh, firestorms. The Santa Ana winds are blowing uh, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. The winds are, the fires are out of control because of these winds. And uh, Wendy, they, they say they've never been this bad. Well, what that, do you that's exactly right. They have never seen it this bad before in California. Extremely high winds are driving the state's powerful wildfires. The state's warning system has reached an unprecedented level. The state's fire direct director says winds could reach hurricane strength at 80 miles per hour. 90,000 acres have burned in Ventura already. People returned to their neighborhoods to discover their homes, nothing but rubble. I'm grateful we have our home, but I'm very sad for my neighbors and the way my neighbors look, and it's just horrible. Authorities ordered tens of thousands of people to evacuate because of the three major wildfires burning in Los Angeles and Ventura counties. Nearly 200 homes and buildings have been destroyed. We need to definitely pray for them. Well, Minnesota Senator Al Franken is expected to resign from Congress today. At least seven more women have now come forward, accusing the Minnesota senator of sexual misconduct. A majority of his fellow Democrats in the Senate have called for him to step aside. We need to draw a line in the sand and say none of it is okay. I think today's revelations um, uh, just further add, add to um, a fact pattern here that's just unacceptable. Franken's move comes just two days after Michigan Democratic Congressman John Conyers resigned following similar allegations. But Alabama Republican Roy Moore won't drop out of his Senate race. He's also been accused of sexual misconduct. Pat, do you think Moore's right to do this? Well, this is a ploy by the Democrats to say we're going to put Trump in a box. He has supported Roy Moore, who's been accused of violating uh, teenagers and dating teenagers when he was in his 30s. He's denied all of it. Franken admitted to his stuff. And we have pictures about Franken. We don't have any pictures of Roy Moore doing anything. So we'll see. But the president has said, I want a Republican in there, and that's the way it's going to be. But once he is confirmed, the Senate might well be moving to, uh, you know, deny him a seat. We'll see what happens. But... Uh, they should allow the voters of Alabama to decide who they want to represent them. But uh, many, many Democrats have called on Franken to resign, and he says he's going to do it. Uh, but uh, And Conyers has come out and, and resigned because of the problems that it was clearly what he'd done. But in terms of uh, Trump, they're trying to put him in a box and say, you see, uh, he's two-faced, he's supporting Roy Moore, but... We are clean, and we've gotten rid of Franken and, uh, and the Congressman Conyers. So we, we'll see how it plays out. But it's a political game that they're playing, and so you've got to recognize what's going on and um, see how it plays. Well, here's Wendy again. Pat, despite all the scandals swirling in Washington, it is the holiday season, a time for many of us to be thankful. And as Pat reminds us, thankfulness is something we should practice all year round.
How important is thanksgiving? Listen, I think, you know, praise for God for who He is and thanksgiving for what He's done. I, I remember some years ago, my wife and I didn't have much money, and uh, we were living in a, a house that was provided to us by our philanthropist. And it, this was kind of a wretched house. It had no central heat. And so in order to get warm in a cold winter, we had to go into the kitchen and uh, turn the stove on and sit around to get warm because there was no heat in the building. It was in an area where there was some really bad neighbors. It was a miserable place to have my wife and children. And so I told my wife, I said, now listen, dear, I know this is nice, but don't you ever complain. Don't you ever complain. Don't you ever complain. And we will praise God for what we've got. And when the time comes, he'll get us out of here. And so that was our attitude, and there was no complaining. And before long, I, I went to my philanthropist friend. I said, what do you think about my building a house? He said, I think it's a terrible idea. He said, why should you build a house when I've got that beautiful place out in the country with nobody in it? And uh, you can have it if you want it. Wow. So I moved from this wretched place in a slum out to a uh, beautiful colonial with columns, um, oak trees, a thousand acres of land around it, uh, uh, magnificent, beautiful. And that's what the Lord had for us. But he said, mm. don't complain. Mm. And when I didn't complain, and, and this, this man said, I don't know of any preacher that will accept what you've accepted and where you live where you've, you've lived. And basically, he recognized I hadn't complained. Answered Prayer, available January 15th. Great lesson there, Pat. No complaining. Well, I hope this uh, uh, DVD is a blessing to people. It's going to be available January. We want to tell you, we've got some teaching in there that I think is very important, how to have your prayers answered, some examples of answered prayer, some wonderful experiences from my own personal life. And Scott and I had a great time together, and I, we want to share it with you coming January the 1st, answered prayer. That's so very exciting. I mean, I, I think people love hearing how God has moved in your life yes. based on things he's asked you to do or not do. Well, I've, I've got uh, plenty of stories. <laughs> 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 They're in that DVD with Scott and I. It was, Scott and I have a lot of fun together. And uh, so uh, <laughs> he rides motorcycles and I ride horses and we're both crazy doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to agree with that. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that's coming. Watch January the 1st. But that uh, will tell you how to get it, how it'll become available to you uh, in the first of the year. But it, it, I just wanted to give you a little flavor of what's there because it's, it's, it's the, the crew really liked it. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope it's going to be. Well, it's a good word. Every, everybody wants to know how to have your prayers answered. Absolutely. We get a lot of those questions in our email. All <laughs> so. right. Well, coming up, Brits living under the fear of terrorist attacks may very well fear being called racist even more. Political establishment is terrified of being called racist or Islamophobe. You're guilty until you're proved innocent. And of course, the process of proving innocent may well destroy you anyway. See why you have to be very careful what you say in Britain today after this. Well, ISIS seems to be out of the game when Raqqa was taken over their headquarters and the caliphate that they were uh, uh, announcing to the world seemingly is in tatters. But it's still a force to be reckoned with and it's threatening a deadly terrorist attack in London against Christmas shoppers. And Islamists were planning to assassinate British Prime Minister Theresa May. But as Dale Hurd reports, against all logic, many European leaders seem to be more concerned about stamping out so-called Islamophobia than the real threat from radical Islam itself. 
The British Parliament went into emergency session, urging Prime Minister Theresa May to cancel President Trump's planned visit to Britain next year. One MP even said the American president should be arrested if he sets foot on British soil. You might have thought Donald Trump ordered the sinking of a British battleship or insulted the Queen. What Trump did was retweet videos of alleged Muslim violence from a British fringe anti-Islamization group that the British establishment detests. While many considered the president's tweets a bad idea, especially since the factualness of one of the videos has been disputed, the whole episode showed again that the British establishment is obsessed with so-called hate speech, even more, some say, than the threat of terrorism. One response to Muslim radicalism in Britain has been to attack the critics, as if criticism of the problem is as bad or worse than the problem itself. 3,400 Britons were arrested last year for online hate speech. That usually means people who criticize Islam. Almost 10 times the number arrested for terrorism-related offenses. While British police have had to let suspects of other crimes go because of cutbacks. At the root of it all, say officials we interviewed, is the belief that criticism of Islam is a terrible thing. It's called racism, even though Islam is not a race. Racism is the kind of 21st century equivalent of being accused of witchcraft in the 17th century. You're guilty until you're proved innocent. And of course, the process of proving innocent may well destroy you anyway. Gerard Batten is a member of the European Parliament for UKIP, the UK Independence Party. Uh, but you see, our political establishment is terrified of being called racist or Islamophobe because it's one of the worst things you can be accused of. Uh, because once you've been labelled that and it sticks, that's the end of your career. You're not going anywhere. The same British government that has devoted more money and manpower to stamp out criticism of Islam online dragged its feet when investigating a huge rape gang scandal involving mostly Pakistani heritage men who preyed on as many as one million mostly white English girls. The same government continues to allow the existence of Sharia courts and has hosted radical Islamic events on government property. We filmed this Palestine conference, which included known anti-Semites and terrorism supporters, at the government-owned QE2 Center, the same venue where a Christian conference on traditional marriage was banned. The other Trump tweet that miffed British leaders was when he told the Prime Minister she should care more about the terrorist threat facing her own nation. Then police this week uncovered a plot by Islamic terrorists to blow up 10 Downing Street and kill Theresa May. British police and MI5 are said to be monitoring 20,000 potential terrorists. There have been five terror attacks in 2017 alone that have killed more than 30 and injured hundreds. Every day, every day I fear another terrorist attack. Raheem Kassam is Breitbart London editor-in-chief and author of No-Go Zones. This is the new normal for us. Every day I wake up, check my phone and see where the latest terror attack has been. And yet we're still pulling this pillow over our head saying, la la la, we can't hear you, we can't figure it out, nobody knows what's going on. Peter McElvenna, an aide to Lord Pearson in the House of Lords, called the amount of time the British government spent debating President Trump's tweets madness. But he told us the British establishment can never admit that Islamic culture is a threat to safety and to a free society. Uh, I thought in Manchester, when you have a bomb with children, that that would really shock people. And it did shock people, but Again, there is a fear of addressing what may lie behind us. So if it can't stop the message that Islam is a threat, it will go after the messengers. The British government seems almost obsessed with what it calls social cohesion. Think of it as government-enforced social harmony, backed up by the police. It's an attempt to keep a lid on boiling social tensions. But the social tensions are still there. And that means when it comes to criticism of Islam, or even the superiority of British values, free speech in Britain is gone. If anybody was to talk about the superiority of British values over other people's values, they'd probably find themselves arrested and on a charge of racism or Islamophobia. And I'm not kidding. You have to be very careful what you say in Britain today. Something we were all reminded of when the American president sent those tweets. Dale Hurd, CBN News, London. Thanks, Dale. Man, he's, he's getting some penetrating uh, reports. And uh, isn't that shocking that the land of the Magna Carta, the land that gave us the British uh, uh, judicial system, 
that has been so formative in what we have here, the rule of law and so forth, that it has degenerated into this. It's just amazing. You know, when you lose Christianity, though, when you lose your essential faith in God and in the Bible, what are the standards? What are the standards? Well, we're losing it here in America. The standard used to be the, the, the Bible. We had a, a cohesive culture that, that uh, affirmed certain values, certain principles that were reflected in what we call the Judeo-Christian uh, ethic that was based on the Bible. And once that goes, then it's open season. You, you don't have any foundation. What is the anchor of your belief? What is the, is the, the foundation of your belief? Well, it becomes a majority of what the majority thinks is right at any given point of time. And that's a shifting goal. You, you, you never know what is correct or not. And what has seized our universities is what we call political correctness, which, uh, you know, is, is an amalgam of these strange views uh, that, that are not biblical in, in any uh, sense of the word. So we've got to go back to the Bible. And if we can teach the Bible and instruct the children in, in biblical values, we'll be far ahead. But instead of that, we've taken the Bible and prayer out of the schools, so they have no foundation. And furthermore, we're not teaching them history. We're not teaching them the, the, the uh, essential facts that deal with the founding of our great republic. And so anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we see it in Britain. I hope and pray we don't go that same way. Terry? But may it be fair warning, because often what happens in Britain today is Comes in America back, tomorrow. Exactly, exactly. It's frightening. Well, up next, she was 13 years old when she hooked up with Charles Manson and family. I was going to jump off a cliff after Charlie raped me. I was really hurt by that. I didn't feel like I belonged there anymore, but I didn't know where to go. See how this woman survived and why she finally revealed her identity as a member of the family after this. Welcome back. You're watching The 700 Club. We're delighted to have you with us as we continue exciting programs for you on this station and on this program. Well, Diane Lake lived an ordinary life for more than 30 years. She was a teacher. She was a wife. And she was a mother of three children. And then one day she received a phone call exposing her past. And Diane had to acknowledge the truth that began when she was 13 years old and a member of the Charles Manson family. I needed to be loved and adored and respected. And, you know, I needed to have a purpose. And I, I didn't have that until I met Charles Manson and family. Diane Lake was a child of the 60s hippie movement. Her father led her on her first LSD trip when she was only 13 years old. That same year, her parents sold their Southern California home and moved the family into a bread truck where they could be free from societal restrictions. It was difficult living in a bread truck with five people. And so I, it was un, I was just uncomfortable. And when I thought what was God's voice telling me it's time to leave home, I talked to my parents and they wrote me a note. The note gave Diane permission to leave her parents and live as she saw fit, even though she was only 13. When she met Charles Manson and family, Diane quickly fell under the influence of the sex, drugs, and mind control he used to manipulate the girls who joined him. I, I needed to belong. I needed to be part of, of this movement, part of a family. It's part of his con that he was able to hone in on whatever a person's weaknesses were, whatever their needs were, and then fill it, provide it. I mean, he was a master at that, and he used it to manipulate. He made all of us, I think, feel individually they, that we were his favorite, that we were loved and adored. Manson distorted spiritual ideas and tried to convince Diane and others he was the Messiah. He would, you know, talk 
things that came from the Bible or Scientology or who knows where, you know, different different aspects of, of life. And they made seem like he, he had a, a, an ability to make nonsense make sense. Diane was a devoted follower, giving her mind and body over to Manson's will and desires. You, you don't want to accept the truth. You don't want to accept the truth that, that you've committed yourself or you've, you know, given yourself over to a madman. It's hard. It's, it's, that's kind of the process that I'm going through now is really uh, realizing and accepting that I, I gave myself over to a madman. She endured physical, mental, and sexual abuse at the hand of Charles Manson and those he gave her away to. At times, it seemed more than she could handle. I was going to jump off a cliff after Charlie raped me. I was really hurt by that, and I, I was ready to jump off the cliff. I just didn't, you know, I, I didn't feel like I belonged there anymore. But I didn't know where to go. As time went on, Manson's preaching became more violent. He taught the family how to use a knife to prepare for helter-skelter a race war he said would soon be coming. In order to protect myself or to avoid being killed, I was going to have to kill. But I didn't realize that, and, and was he training us to, to, to start Helter Skelter, to, that we were going to go out and kill? I, I, I viewed it as a way to, that we might need this information to protect ourselves from from being killed. But a short time later, Diane learned Tex Watson and other Manson family members had taken part in a grisly murder spree, killing actress Sharon Tate and several others. It didn't make sense. You know, these people that I had loved were, had murdered people. There was a certain amount of glee, giddiness, um, detachment. You know, they were almost like, as I remember, thinking they were kind of bragging about what they had done, you know? And that just didn't seem right at all. And, and Tex was, you know, when he first told me, he was like, I did this, you know? Charlie told me, he was proud too. He was proud that he had done this because Charlie had asked him to. When Charles Manson and his family members were arrested, Diane became a key witness for the prosecution. And I was able to look, you know, the girls and Charlie in the eye, and I was kind of afraid going in. It's like, is he going to have mind control over me? But he showed me his real colors and that, you know, with his antics in the courtroom, that it broke any lingering doubts about my affection for him, for sure. For, for sure. After the convictions, Diane was able to rejoin society and eventually became a Christian where she found her true purpose and identity. She now says that her survival was only by God's love and grace. Jesus is a servant. He's a servant leader. He, he loves us no matter what, you know, and, and he's there to hold us up with the dirty face and the, the tears. I really feel like he was holding me in the palm of his hand. And, you know, I, I just thank God for seeing me through and that's why you know I want to sh share that with people I, I didn't want it to be a secret anymore it was a dark dark episode in American history but I survived I prevailed you know and I want to bring some light into this whole dark era in her book member of the family she says she believes God was with her through it all and gave her the grace she needed to move past her time in the Manson family. Now I really want to, you know, share this remarkable saving grace that I can only attribute to to God. I mean, I've had a wonder, you know, I had a wonderful husband, have wonderful children, you know, great church family. It's only by the grace of God. So I'm thankful. I'm thankful for God. I'm thankful for Jesus Christ as my Savior. What happens when light comes in? You see, we're surrounded by darkness. It's amazing. The, the uh, physicists and the 
astrophysicists tell us that a large part of what's out in the universe is what they call dark matter. You can't even see it. Darkness. Darkness is out there. And uh, there's some lights, and the lights are so important. Uh, but Manson was dark. It was dark and hideous. And he had these girls under his uh, control, and he brainwashed them, and they would do what he told them to do. And they were offering the, their bodies to people. And, you know, they, they, uh, the Beach Boys came across them in one encounter, apparently. And these girls were so seductive. But that's not light, it's darkness. And we're surrounded by darkness. Like it or not, there's darkness in the world. And Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He comes and brings light into your life. And when you have that light, uh, you don't walk in darkness. And you have the light of life. And you become alive in the light. And you, 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 you sleep in the darkness. And the darkness uh, wants to uh, overcome you. But uh, he said, I'm, come, I'm a light into the world. And he is the light for you and me, wherever we are. He brings light into our soul. And when the light comes, we begin to see the truth about God. You see, darkness is descending on the world. And place after place after place, they're being consumed by darkness. But Jesus Christ is the light. It's like you walk into a dark room and you light one candle or you light one match. And the match, the light goes all the way throughout the room, and the darkness can't overcome the light. And so in your life, what you need is the light of Jesus. And that light will show you where to go. You won't stumble around like in the dark. You won't be grasping and groping for the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And if you want to be free, I urge you today just pray with me right now. And Jesus Christ, the light of the world, will come into their life, your life. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Pray with me now. Pray these words. Jesus, that's right, pray with me. Jesus, I know that you are the light of the world. And I <clears throat> confess that I have walked in darkness because I haven't had the light but right now, Lord, I want the light. I want you to come into my heart and bring me the light of the world. So right now, I turn to you, and I turn away from darkness. I turn away from shame. I turn away from sin. And I give you my heart. And I say, Lord Jesus, right now, come into my heart. Live your life in me. And I will live for you, and I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. And thank you for coming in to my life. Thank you, Lord. If you prayed with me, I want to give you something. I want you to go to your telephone. I want you to call in and say, look, I prayed with Pat. Now, if you don't want to give us your number, that's fine. If you don't want to give us your name, that's fine. But yeah, I do want you to call and talk to one of these counselors on the phone who loves you. Now, we're going to send you something absolutely free. It's called A New Day. It's a beautiful little packet, and it has a compact disc in here that sent me some minutes of, of intense teaching about what happens when you are born again and what happens if you sin and all the things that, that you need to know to get you started. And I'll give this to you free, but right now, as we're moving into this Christmas season, Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and he's coming to your life. I want you to celebrate it. The number is toll-free. There's no financial obligation, none whatsoever. It's, uh, eight, it's 700, 7,000. That's easy to remember. You dial 1-800, and it's, if you're, uh, uh, you're into long distance, it's a free call. So call in right now. Here's Terry. Well, still ahead, your questions, honest answers. Christian says, what is true forgiveness? Do we have to forget an offense to really forgive? Pat will answer that and much more after this.
Welcome back to the 700 Club. In Australia, Parliament voted today to legalize gay marriage. The bill defines marriage as a union between two persons. Churches, religious organizations, and existing ministers are not required to do gay weddings. However, ministers who are licensed after the law passes will have to perform same-sex weddings. If they don't, they'll be in violation of anti-discrimination laws. Lawmakers rejected amendments that would have protected freedoms of speech and religion. A gay man who was denied a marriage license by Kentucky clerk Kim Davis wants to replace her. David Ermold announced his candidacy for Rowan County Clerk Wednesday. Ermold and several other gay men applied for marriage licenses in 2015 but Davis says she couldn't issue the licenses in good conscience. She believes same-sex marriage is wrong because of her Christian faith. She spent five days in jail for taking her stand. Davis plans to run for re-election in Kentucky next year. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, it's time to address some of your questions with some honest answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Christian, who says, I'm going through a very hard time in my marriage. My wife is a very angry person. I don't know how much longer I can continue in this relationship. However, I'm committed to stay in the word of God and attempt to love her despite her unjust anger. I want to know what true forgiveness really is. Does forgiving mean to forget an offense? Well, I think only God can forget uh we can't forget stuff, but uh, time heals all wounds, as they say. And, it, you know, you've had an offense against you, and it is raw for the first few days, and then for a week, and then a month. And the thing is, you don't keep bringing it up. You, you let stuff go, and you say, is true forgiveness forgetting? No, but true forgiveness is forgiving. You say, I forgive you, and you mean it. Now, the Bible says it's better to live in the corner of an attic than in a broad house with a arguing and contentious woman. I don't know how you're doing it, but um, uh, you, you're, you're work, trying to work something out. But it's tough. And it, if you're living like that, it's like you're drinking poison every day, and it's, it's uh, corroding your life. Uh, you've got to work out something on that. Your wife has got to get some kind of counseling. It may be she has a neurological problem that has got to be dealt with, but who knows what the problem was. Was she molested when she was a kid? I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. It sounds like she needs professional help, but um, what do you do in a situation like that? It's, it's tough, you know. John Wesley lived with a woman that he'd married, and this woman was horrible, and she pulled his hair and screamed at him, and claimed he was, quote, bedding down with a whore and all this stuff. It was terrible. So she left. And he said, I didn't send her away, and I didn't, I didn't go, go get her. her. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, it was gone. But he didn't, he didn't remarry, but it was kind of like, I'm glad to get rid of that awful woman. So, you know, that's the tough, you asked me a tough question, and but she definitely, you need to insist on it. She needs some professional help to heal that anger. What, what, what is the source of that bitterness, that anger uh, that, that's in her life? Okay. Okay, this is Casey who says, Hi, Pat. I'm going to be turning 18 soon, and I would like to move out. Whenever I talk to my parents about it, they say that I need to stay with them until I get married. I feel like moving out is a part of growing up and becoming independent. Does it say anything in the Bible about having to stay with your parents until you're married? Well, it says that <laughs> Jesus went home from, um, from uh, Jerusalem and was subject to... Uh, his parents, uh, but he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I think uh, when he got to be 30, he entered into his ministry. Uh, so that's, that's, of course, he left home by then. And uh, you remember uh, he said to his mother, don't you understand I've got to be about my father's business. In your case, uh, you're 18, you're still mighty young, and you know, you don't have to get married to leave home, but uh, to leave home at 18 is kind of foolish. 
I mean, there are a lot of responsibilities that are heaped upon you, and your parents are uh, absorbing them so that you can get an education. And you should be spending your time learning a trade or craft or, or getting a, uh, some kind of a degree so that you're able to deal with life. You don't have to be married or any of that. There's nothing that I know that says you've got to be married. But just from an intelligent standpoint, why not let your parents take the buffering that goes along with life? I mean, there are all kinds of forms you have to live with. There, there are rules and regulations that you have to be under. And why not let them work with you until you get to the point where uh, you can be free? But, uh, you know, uh, Jesus was subject to his parents, the Bible says, when he, when he came home. And he was about 12 when uh, they made that, so he was clearly a teenager, mm -hmm. and he lived at home. All right? It's also very expensive to live on your own. Well, of course it is. A lot of kids, <laughs> people are moving back into their parents. Yes, they are. And, and that's not a good you, you know that first day? Yes. Right. That's not a good thing. All right. All right. Well, coming up, are you tired of being on the holiday hamster wheel? Well, get ready for a total Christmas makeover when we come back. Well, during the Christmas season, we should spend time celebrating Christ's birth, and we should never forget to invite Jesus to his own party. But with all the hustle and the bustle that's a part of the holidays, it's easy often to overlook the reason for the season. But our next guest is here to talk more about this. So please welcome to the 700 Club, Melissa Spelstra. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Thanks so much for having Boy, me. You've written a wonderful book, Total Christmas Makeover. You know, this time of the year is so full of pandemonium, you know, just yeah. doing stuff, <laughs> lists of things. It's only the first weekend in December, so we still have time to make Jesus the focal point. How do we do yeah, that? We do. Well, the Total Christmas Makeover isn't about scrapping everything you did before or about adding like 10 more things to your to-do list. Mm -hmm. It's more about looking at how did God give us instructions about biblical celebration? <gasps> you know, for me, I was studying the book of Numbers, and I was noticing the Passover and the Days of Atonement and how God <laughs> is serious about his holy days. And so taking, while we have no biblical mandate for how to celebrate Christmas, we have a lot of grace and a lot of freedom. How can we look at those and apply some of these concepts of biblical celebration? It, he really does give it to us as an instruction book for how to live. So we yes. ought to be watching and reading and understanding all of that. But for some people, Melissa, the holidays can be very unsettling. Maybe they grew up with some issues that happen, often issues happen during mm -hmm. the holidays if yes. there's been a loss of someone then how do we deal with sadness or loss or or even memories that are unpleasant at this time of the year yeah well I know there's people I know this is their first Christmas without a loved one yes. and so there's grief associated with that or maybe they're facing a cancer diagnosis and they're walking through it for the first time this holiday season and as we look at biblical celebration it was about remembering who God was yes. who God is and what he's done. Yeah. And so if we strip away all the trappings of Christmas and get to the heart of Christ, that's where the hope is. Yeah. Whether we're in a season of suffering or in a season of celebration, wherever we're at, when we strip it away and put our focus in our heart and, and remember him. So how did God change this in your life? How did you go from just doing Christmas to doing Christmas intentionally? Well, as I did study these these biblical celebrations in the Old Testament, it was interesting to me that right before they go into the promised land, God takes the time to review the holy days, the holidays. And I saw in those kind of three things, rituals, mm -hmm. change the things you eat or the things you put in your home or the services that you go to, the kind of the holy assembly, relationships, a focus on people, mm -hmm. and then rest, stopping yeah. ordinary work. And so for me personally, I'm trying to say, oh, how do I take these things and what does this look like for me at Christmas? What are some of the special things you do over the holiday season to really help you focus? Yeah, you know, when the kids were little, we did something called the Jesse tree, which was yes. just where we did a little reading each mm -hmm. day from the Bible and had these little ornaments we hung on the tree. Now my kids are in high school and college. So the thought of everybody being home every night to read something doesn't work. So we do a weekly devotion led by each of our kids. Oh. So that we just set aside a time and it, it takes some planning, yes. not, you know, adding a ton of things, but some, a posture change to say, how can we prioritize the Christmas traditions that really focus on Christ? 
It just seems like part of the holiday, whether you want it or not, is a little chaotic, whether it's being out in the marketplace doing something or just trying to do the things in your home that you've talked about. How do you get through the chaos of that right. to a place of, because what you're talking about requires quiet, it requires peace. And that rest, you know, yes. uh, my friend always says, Jesus sure picked a busy month to have a birthday, right? <laughs> but the reality is we are the keepers of our schedule and the keeper God has given us our time. And so it's about our priorities. It's about saying as much as I'm gonna schedule my shopping, my decorations, I'm gonna spend some time with the mm. savior who came, I mean, what, is that how we want to say happy birthday, Jesus, I have no time for you, I've got to get my to-do list done? Yeah, got, got to wrap my gifts. Yeah. <laughs> I love the fact that you did Total Christmas Makeover in a devotional format. Why did you decide to do that? You know, I do think it's a busy time and we don't have time to read large chunks. So every day there's just some scripture, kind a devotional. Kind of pulls you back into yeah. this is the way just we're going. Just five or 10 you know? minutes to say, Jesus, you're the priority here. And then some reflection questions to think about. Mm. And then some practical ideas and not like this is the way it should be done. Again, there's no biblical mandate for how we yes. celebrate Christmas. There's liberty and freedom. But I think we have to ask questions like, how will this honor Christ? Mm. How will this impact my family? Will this leave me time to pray and rest and study? Yeah. You know, there's so much for us to think about in all of this, and, and a lot of it's in the Word, and you've done the homework for us. Total Christmas makeover. I, I know you felt compelled because of the chaos of the season to write something like this for all of us. And I just want to say to you, if you're like me, you know, I, I do try that. We have traditions in our family that we try to do, but every year my intentions are so good about wanting to really focus on making Jesus real to my family. Total Christian Makeover, 31 devotions to celebrate with purpose. It's available nationwide. You can also pick up more tips from Melissa on our Facebook page. If you'd like to watch her social exclusive of interview, log on to facebook.com slash 700 club. Again, the book is Total Christmas Makeover, and I think it'll help you make over your Christmas. Thank you. Great to have you here Thank with you us. So Merry Christmas. Me. Merry Christmas to you. Pat? You know, Terry, the best Christmas I think I ever had was in Jerusalem. We didn't have any tree. We didn't have any mistletoe. We didn't have any decorations. Uh, we had a wonderful time, and I was able to baptize 59 people in the Jordan River on Christmas Day. That's the way to do it. Well, we leave you with our power many from the Psalms. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Well, that's all the time we've got for Terry and me. Uh, it's a joy to have you with us. And until tomorrow, bye-bye.